All right. Good morning, everyone. If everyone could get to their seats, grab your coffee, grab your name tags. Uh, I'm Joe Poor with Pauly Jail Building Company. My brother, Bob Poor, who's not here today. Uh, we're fifth generation owners. We've been jail builders for 166 years. Yes, I know. I look very good for 166 years old. All right. So come up to me later. I'll give you the secret. But I think today I want to thank everyone who's traveled to come here to be in person. Also, all the people that are watching us on a webinar. This is the first time we've ever done an in-person seminar with a webinar at the same time. So if we could, let's just have a round of applause for the Sanders group, all right, who's put all of this together. They're the ones who have made it happen, all right? So today, um, I think we're going to see, you're going to see new products and technologies. We're going to get into the world of mental health, which I know for a lot of the county commissioners, architects, and sheriffs, that has got to be the number one issue. So you're going to see new technologies, new pre presentations, and when we go out underneath the tent today, you're going to see new products that you have never seen before. So I want to encourage everyone who's here to do, go out at the break at 10 o'clock and, and go up to the manufacturers, kick the tires, if you will. And then for the people that are on the webinar, we got a first time, we're actually going to do live interviews. So you'll get to see Mike Smith from Steel Cell of North America's new mental health cell. I know you're not here in person, but we're going to do a live interview. So we're going to walk you through the cell. So I think for the first time ever, that's going to be a, a first feature we've ever done. So one thing before we get started today, um, I don't know how many of you know this, but a lot of, a lot of you know my brother Bob. He's been uh, battling cancer for the last two years, which is why he's, he's not here today, okay? But he is watching. So let's give a shout out to my brother Bob. And with that, we're going to run a little historical video, and then we're going to introduce the keynote speaker. All right. Thank you very much, everyone, for showing up. My brother and I are fifth generation jail builders. We learned to do quality work from our father who learned from his father and all the way back to 1856 when Pauly Jail Building Company was first founded. Going back 166 years ago, our great, great grandfathers were some of the original inventors of a lot of the products that we still use today in the correctional industry. Five generations of doing quality work and doing it right. We have a county jail, it's Hendricks County, Indiana. My great, great grandfather built the first jail there in 1866. It's still there, it's a historical building today, but we came back 150 years later and built the new Hendricks County Jail, which is just about complete today, but we did it with the same thought process. Use quality products, use quality installation people, deliver a quality product on time, under budget, head of schedule. This jail behind me was built in 1866, and in the basement, there are two plaques that show Polly as a partner even back then. What I've learned about Polly Jail is that they are the folks who come on scene and make a regular building into a detention facility. We've had a fantastic partnership working with the team there, from the architects to the builders to the Polly Jail team, and it's just been an outstanding experience. One of the things that we think separates this team, the Polly Jail team and our quality manufacturers, from other teams is that we actually have our own installation company. When those products come out to your job site and they need to be installed, well, Pauly Jail has their own union iron workers factory trained at all these different manufacturers' factories. So every time your product shipped to my job site, my guys know exactly what product is coming. They know exactly how to install it. We know how to maintain it. So we built this for the future. Everything we put into this was with the idea of efficiency for the inmates and the staff. If they come into the inside, they'll see this as one of the most modern jails in the state and a place that the community can be proud of now and 50 or 100 years into the future. My real goal here with you and the Pauly team and everybody else on this job was that when we were done and the dust had settled, anybody who wanted to know how to do a jail right could come to Danville, Indiana and see a jail done right. When we walk off the job, it's going to say Pauly Jail Building Company and all of our team of manufacturers. To us, for 166 years, 
That's meant everything. By the way, thank you, Sheriff Clark for Hendricks County for that nice video. And um, now we're gonna start off the seminar actually with our keynote speaker. And I wanna introduce him, he's Sheriff Stanford. He serves as president of the National Sheriff's Association. He's the 80th National Sheriff's President and the seventh representing the state of Ohio. Sheriff Stanford is currently serving his seventh term as the Fayette County Sheriff and has served his county and community since 1997. So with no further introductions, Sheriff, you have the stage. Have a round of applause for the Sheriff. I often caution you about applauding first. <laughs> yeah. I'm uh, proud to be here, proud to be able to present to the, uh, uh, to the fellow sheriffs and uh, contractors and disregard the guy on the screen. Uh, that's not, you know, I, I, I'm not sure why they do that to you. That's intimidation. Uh, and I, I wondered why they had me come in as speaker, I mean, although as national president, it, it is an honor to represent America's uh, 3,100 sheriffs across the country and to be able to speak for them on issues as important as the border uh, down on the, uh, the, our southern border the issues, I, I work with those issues on a daily basis. Uh, we're, we're talking every day to sheriffs across the country on many different issues, including jails. And I'm not an expert on being a sheriff. I'm not an expert on being jail. But what I found out is when you travel more than 50 miles from your home, you become an expert. So my qualification to speak to you today is this facility is 62 miles from my home. And I've got a business card. <laughs> that makes me a professional. I you know we're we're there. Uh, I, I give you just a little bit of, of idea of where I come from. Fayette County is a small rural county just south of Columbus. Uh, Colum Columbus is a big metropolitan area, as you well know. Uh, we are uh, we we often view Columbus and Franklin County as a suburb of Fayette County. Um, because what happens in Columbus, you know, we end up with the, with the uh, side effects, uh, whether it's good or bad. Uh, often it's the bad. Uh, when someone commits a crime in Columbus, they run to Fayette County. <laughs> and we catch them, we put them on our jail. And then we've got, we, we deal with the big issues of the metropolitan areas in the small rural counties. I became sheriff in 1997. I started my career as a Washington Courthouse police officer in 1981. And I uh, evolved, um, it, it, I wasn't promoted, it just it was an evolution to become the jail administrator of a municipal jail at the city police department. And I often view that as they said, and it was a small jail, eight, eight bed jail, but it was a municipal jail. And I think they just said, oh, Vernon can do that. Vernon, Vernon can do this, Vernon can do that. And when it came time after our chief of police retired, the next chief moved in, and he had been the jail administrator. And uh, the, the new guy coming in said, I, I don't know a thing about jails. Vernon, let Vernon do it. And so I just became the jail administrator over an eight-bed jail. But that positioned me to start interacting with our county jail, who was a much larger jail in Fayette County. And we started looking at a lot of the different aspects of why we have a, a eight bed municipal jail that was outdated. Uh, it was built in the uh, 60s, uh, early 70s, after a inmate in the old city jail, which was one big room, uh, you can visualize that room, froze to death. You say, how did that happen? Well, they forgot to put windows in that cell, in that jail, and he literally was thrown in there as a drunk uh, and left in there, and he, he froze, literally froze to death. So they, they were, they didn't, you know, 
Today you get sued, back then they didn't get sued. They said, well, maybe we need to build a jail. So they built, uh, they just brought in these boxes and they called it a jail. And that's how we operated the city jail for the next several decades. But this, the, the county jail, I, be, I became involved as the city administrator, jail administrator. I became involved with the county sheriff's office and in the, a project of building a jail. So this would have been 1994, 1995 area. Um, and they were talking about building a jail in 1995. And they wanted to replace the old jail. It took us from three sheriffs into my term 25 years later before we actually had a jail built that replaced an 1884 jail that we thought was running pretty good, although it had a lot of a lot of problems with it being an old jail. But it had a lot of history to it. We knew how everything ran. I have with me today my, my current jail administrator, uh, Lieutenant Weedman. He's been with, he's been, he worked in the jail for 30 years. Knew every, knew every corner, he knew every pipe, he knew everything about that jail. But it was, it became to the point that it was such a liability for the county we had to start moving forward and trying to find out how to build a new jail. And it took me 25 years as sheriff, 20 years as sheriff, to actually get the community ready to build a new jail. Nothing was gonna happen overnight. And if you think it's gonna happen, I don't believe anyone sitting here that's ever gone through a jail project knows it happens just because you want it to happen. I wanted it to happen. The state of Ohio had monies back in the 90s to build jails. Uh, anybody remember the influx of money we had? Uh, everybody was building jails. But they wanted us to build a regional jail throughout the state of Ohio. <coughs> Instead of county jails, regional jails. When I became sheriff, we were involved in a regional jail concept. And, but it also, have, 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 coming into the, the, to the game as a jail administrator, even from a small jail, I had questions about what does this mean for my community to be involved in a, in, in a regional jail? And they failed to give us the answers, the adequate answers as to where this was going to lead us in the construction, in the operation, and in the future of a regional jail concept. I was, and I, the more I looked at it, the more I realized we lose an identity when we lose our jail. And, once we, and we were going to lose our jail in its entirety. We were going to have to, with the concept, we had to close our municipal jail, we would have to close our county jail, and force everything to go to a regional jail, which was supposed to be down the road, somebody else's road, not my road. Now, the issue with me when I decided that I needed to get out of the regional jail concept is they said, we're going to give you 30 beds in the regional jail. And I said, well, let me do some math here. And I'm not strong in math, but I figured out I had eight <coughs> municipal beds and I had 50 county beds in the current jail. Now, a quick math adds up to 58 beds, approximately, you know, give or take a few that were, uh, that were uh, not usable at the time or whatever, but that's 58 beds. And here the state's telling me, we're gonna give you 30 beds. So I said, what am I gonna do with the other 18 people? And they said, well, you could rent the beds from the other counties that don't use their beds. So, well, this doesn't make much sense. It still doesn't make any sense. So I said, why would I be losing bed space? And then I'd have to rent just to get the current population moved to a new regional jail. And so we backed out. I, 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 com I convinced the commissioner, let's back out of the regional jail. I think we need to build our own jail. And, and, you know, and I was punished for that by the state of Ohio. I don't know if anybody here from the state of Ohio. Um, uh, but they came to me and said, you get out of our regional jail concept and we'll not fund you. Well, they held true to the words because they haven't funded us yet. We built the jail through our own, our own levy. Um, they took the money from the regional jail and gave it to the other counties, and they built new jails. They, they didn't give them to the regional jail. They built their own county jails. 
but we were we were kind of on we, we were the black sheep of the family out of in the jail community and and we were ostracized so we we had to systematically go back and start all over and justify building our jail which was difficult because we were also in the phase of building schools so we were in direct competition with our schools now i came from the attitude of you know let's take care of our kids first so i took the back seat to school levies let the schools and we and we now have some of the best schools in the state of ohio i believe but it took, that was a process let those levies pass because if you put a jail levy and a school levy on at the same time, chances are both are going to fail because it's just not a, 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 an attractive levy to put on the ballot. So we, we stepped back from our school levies, let the school levies go in place. They built their schools, city and county. We have two, Fayette County has two districts, uh, two large massive districts, but we only have two districts in our, in our county. But each one needed new buildings. Each one needed new levees to, to build and operate. We finally got that out of the way. And then they had another. And they came in and said, we need a, an EMS levy. Oh, come on. So I took a back seat. And we have a county-wide EMS. Most counties uh, in the state of Ohio have multiple EMS services. Every fire district has a service. Every city, you know. Fay County were a little different. We had one service, countywide, city, county, everything was under one operation, and they needed a levy to function because they were, they were basically going from a volunteer to a full-time operation. So I again took the back seat to an EMS levy. And now we're talking 20, 25 years. We finally get to the place where we can put a levy on to build our jail. Any county commissioners in the room? Well, thank you. <laughs> Hi, guys. <laughs> you want to leave the room uh, <laughs> for the next phase? Uh, county commissioners can be your, your best friends or they can be your worst enemies. Um, they typically don't know how to build a jail. So the county commissioners that raise your hands, this is a great big step for you guys to be here to understand. And so my hat's off to you. I, this room should be filled with county commissioners. Um, or county administrators, whatever you choose to call those people that's going to be intimately involved in the jail construction. But they typically don't know what's needed in a jail. And that's fine with me because I view my county commissioners not as construction managers, but as financial managers. They need, you know, and I've, I've stepped away from looking at, at I, don't, I don't fund anything. I don't fund building the jail. I don't, we don't, I don't, I encourage my guys, you don't write tickets to generate revenue. That's not what we do. You know, uh, the guys on the road enforce the laws. The guys in the jail keep our inmates safe. We need, and the, they sh we shouldn't have to worry about where this money comes from. But the county commissioners have to worry about that. And they have to look at that in this perspective as well. Um, many counties, you know, you may have the funds available just to say, okay, we're going to build a jail, and this is the money that's going to build the jail. Most of us have to come from levies, and this is what we had. We, we needed a levy, so we, we, we went about that to educate the public. This is what we need. Now, what does educating the public mean? In Fayette County, they would drive by the jail every day. I, to this day, the, 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 uh, let's give you a little history of my jail. And uh, my jail that, I, that we just replaced was a 1884 structure and used every day from the time it opened up in 1885. Every day. Constant use. Constant inmates. Uh, and it, we, would, we would modify it a little bit. We added electricity. That was a big thing. <laughs> we even added toilets. Uh, that was even bigger. <laughs> You know, instead of giving a slop bucket, you, you, know, you can actually flush your commode. Uh, the technology from 1884 to 2020, you know, you, you can't imagine that. And we actually modified our jail on a continuous basis based on the needs 
of each generation as we, as we progress through. Um, we found an old photograph where they, act, we had a dungeon uh, in, our, in our, the basement was actually kind of a, a dungeon. It had like catacombs, uh, architects in the room, you know, uh, you know th that they had little cubicles back there. We thought, well, that's kind of odd. I think that's where they held some inmates. We don't know that for sure, but it just kind of looks like, we found, it, actually found an old picture when we were cleaning it out before we, uh, after we moved out of a picture of an inmate being processed in the basement, which leads us to further believe that we probably housed some people down in that basement, and that was not the place to be. Uh, I don't care if it was 1884 or 1984. That basement was not a nice place to be. Um, but we had to educate the community of the need, because in their mind, they drove by that building, that's the jail, that's all they needed to know. They, keep, they kept prisoners in, for the most part, and served the needs of the community for 130 years. The community was very comfortable with that. That's the stigma you have to overcome is, okay, now we need to find out how we can educate the community to get our jail mindset that an 1884 building is not adequate for today. We were fighting various lawsuits. We had suicides in the jail. Observation was almost impossible. We were running cameras as many places as we could. Uh, we had a, you know intercom systems. You know, we're just you tack the wire around the wall and just you know um, electric in some of the build and some of the cells was literally conduits were hanging on the wall, and inmates love those to light their cigarettes. Um, but that we just had to modify on a continuous basis to meet the needs of an, uh, from 1884 to today. It was, it was, and but we allowed the community to come in, look at the jail, uh, and the commissioners were well aware because every time I got sued, and of course you know the sheriff's name is on every lawsuit, and, and most of the times the commissioner's name was going to be on the lawsuit because it was usually because the lawsuit was based on our jail was not providing a safe environment for our inmates, and they finally got the message that this is, it's time, it's time. And the old saying is someone loses their elective office when they build a jail. Well, we, it, hasn't proved, it hasn't happened in Fayette County yet, um, but I've seen it happen. Uh, matter of fact, we had one Ohio sheriff that so controversial in building a jail that he was voted out of office two months before the jail opened. You know, and that was disheartening for him. Got a, they got him a nice, he got a nice jail, but he lost his office over it. Most people don't like tax dollars coming, you know, uh, and, and your name's going to be affiliated with that levy, even though it's the commissioners that have to prove to put it on the commissioners, it's the sheriff that owns everything about the, the jail. That's why my encouragement to you, you get involved as a sheriff from the beginning to the very end. Don't leave it to somebody else to handle because you're going to be responsible for it. One of the interesting, and, 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 and in your program, I just flipped it open there as I was getting ready to look, and I saw a key, an old key on the, the, the flyer there. And, I, and here's an interesting story about my jail. We ended up having to tear down the old building. Heartbreaking. Because it was an, to us, it was an historical building. We wanted to keep it. But there was a lot of things that went into play. The, the commissioner decided, no, the building needs to come down. It was not. We had the, 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 construction, the deconstruction company that looked at it said, I could take a hammer and knock this building down just by going to the, we had two chimneys. And, he, and, and we went to, up the attic, and he looked at this, and he said, you know, this building, I can knock this chimney, chip this chimney, it'll, it'll fall in, the whole building's going to collapse in on itself. It's that fragile. Um, it made for inferior bricks back in the 1884s, locally uh, uh, kiln uh, brick. So it was, they were crumbly types. You know, we've all seen those. But the interesting part about the key, we were, we were dismantling the building. We were moving everything out. And before we left the building, before we actually had ready to, to, to uh, um, demolish the building, 
we found a key that was hidden in a closet, we think, since 1885. And we thought, nah, that not, yeah, couldn't happen. But the key was in pristine shape. It had, never, it had never seen a lock. But we got that key and looked at it, and we said, you know, we even talked to the historical society and said, hey, this, is, this is the key. We think this is one of the original keys to the, to the 1884 gym. But it didn't look like anything we had had because we had the original padlock from 1884. We still have that today. And this key did not fit that padlock. We didn't know where this key could have come from. So the museum said, that looks familiar. So they took that key, a picture of the key, and they found the key like that in the museum. That was from the 1842 building. So when the 1842 building was tore down in 1884, the sheriff Somewhere along the way, he said, I better take this key and hang it up so I can, because they, 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 they built the sheriff's residence, which was eventually the sheriff's office, and the sheriff's residence. So in his bedroom, he hung the spare key to the 1884 jail just so they would have it on hand, because the, the jail was on the other side of the block, the city block. But that key hung in that closet probably since 1884, never been moved. We never knew it was there. It was in, a, in, a, it was in a, a, a closet that you walked into and backed out of. And if they had turned around, you would have seen it on the, on the inside of the door. No one ever saw it there. So that's kind of a historical thing that we think about. That key could work today if we still had that lock there. But that's the historical part of getting the community's mindset. And our community was not happy. They, were, they finally accepted the fact we were building a jail. And when they talk to me about the jail, they say, how is your jail? And it's not how the commissioner's jail. It's, it's not how my, you know, they, they, they look at this as the sheriff's jail. So the sheriff is inheriting every part of that from the, from the initial part of it to the day you open up, we own that jail concept. And that's why it's really important as you as administrators know what's going into your jail. Have a great relationship with your architect and not rely on other people to decide things for you. Our architectural firm, and I'm not despairing anything, but you need to own everything that's going into that jail. You need to own that. You, you are professionals. As sheriffs, you know what's needed. And now, all these, I'm sure the room's full of contractors. I don't know, builders, uh, you know, I don't know who all you are, you know, I may get some evil eyes here and I'll find out then shortly what you're, who you're from. But you guys, you know how to put a building up, but a sheriff knows how to run a, run a jail. You need to listen to the sheriff. You need to listen to the professionals. And not rely on your professional to sit back in an office as what's good for, this, for your particular county. You need to own this in, in its entirety. We had things we wanted done, and it just wasn't the concept of, of the architect, and those things didn't, didn't, sometimes didn't go well together. Um, but we've got a jail built today that will last, as we said in the, in the video. You want a jail that's gonna last an, at least another generation, two generations, and I don't think we're gonna get a jail to last 130 years like I had, um, but you wanna be able to build for the future and not just for today. Um, our, and our jail, is, we, we were hoping to build like for the future and population-wise, but dynamics changed, and today we're putting a lot more people in jail, and they're staying for a long time. Um, and that's something you gotta account, account for in the design. Everything you say you want in your jail, you need to follow through with. You, as a sheriff, need to follow through with. If, I, if you think you need it, then you need to make sure it happens in the architectural, phrase, architectural phase. When you get your, your uh, um, general contractor or your uh, construction manager, you need to be there every day with that person. My recommendation to anybody in the room that's getting ready to build is don't rely on other people to do your job for you. 
because it's not going to happen. They're going to see they're going to see things how they want to see it. <coughs> My biggest recommendation is for a sheriff and the county commissioners is to hire somebody that's invested in the county to be your eyes and ears during this construction project. Uh, don't rely on somebody else to, to give you consultation, you know, because it could be biased. We don't want, we don't want that. We want something that, if it's going to be biased, you want it to be biased on behalf of the county. That's the biggest advice I can give anybody. Make sure that you have a person representing you at the table from day one to the, to the day they turn the keys over to you. It's important, vital. Um, somebody that knows construction, knows gel operations would be a, would be a big, big plus. We have the luxury in our jail today, and I think we have a, 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 a very good facility. There's some things that we don't like as we go through the, the process, but a lot of those things are because we didn't have a person sitting at the table saying, wait a minute, that's not, that's not right. I sit at the table, and I'm a sheriff. I know how to do sheriff and stuff. You know, don't know how to do construction stuff. But if we've had somebody sitting at the table that represented Fayette County, then they would have known what I wanted, and they would have known what the architect wanted, and they could have meshed those things together and made it happen. Unfortunately, you listen, you know, there's, there's things that can be done that, that may not be the best. They may be adequate, but they may not be, may not be the best for your circumstance. So we got good equipment. Some of the application is not right, and we're still messing with that as we go through our process. Um, we're still learning. Understand, we came from an 1884 jail. So everything was foreign to us. Locks, where's the key? <clears throat> I still get frustrated when I walk up and I have to push a button and wait for this, the great and powerful wizard in the background saying, <clears throat> hello, Sheriff. And finally the door buzzes and I get to walk through and I walk to another door and I push the button and I wait. And the door finally opens up. And I've got to do that. That's so foreign to me because I came from a jail where you opened up the I had a key, you opened up the door, and you walk through and you just keep right on walking through until you came to the to, to the cells. You walk into the cells, everybody sees you, and it's, and that's not the way it is today. That's but that's a cultural shock that I think we're still suffering from in my jail. It's coming from an 1884 facility to a 2022 facility big cultural shock. I go to the kitchen and I, I, I pride ourselves on our food. Uh, we don't do a food service. We actually prepare our own, we have our own cooks, prepare our own food. And that's even a different atmosphere because the old kitchen was, that was mom's kitchen. <laughs> it was literally, it was just a small kitchen. It just kind of felt like home. And now we're so clinical. You know, we have just cafeteria style and it's just all this you know, shiny stuff, and you know, you got a pot back there that's that big around, and you think you just can't, you know, it's, it's just, it's just not used to that yet. That's the cultural shock that your staff's going to have to go through, and, and I, and that was a big transition. We had eight people, I think eight or nine people, when we left our jail and went to the new jail, and now we've got 21, 22 people back there. That's a cultural shock. That now we're managing this many more people. Now, when I started this, I, 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 when, I, when I came up here about being a professional, you know, I'm 62 miles from home. Well, just a couple miles down the road, you've got some great professionals in the, in the Franklin County Jail. They're building an astronomical facility. I mean, it's a city. It's a city within a city. I don't know how many inmates are going to house the first phase. Is, what, 1,500, 2,000 inmates, I don't, ultimately 3,000 inmates. You know, I, I can't wrap my mind around that, but that's not realistic. You know, that's not realistic. I've got a 120 bed facility. That's almost too much for me to, that's overwhelming for me to think about. And that's most of our communities are looking at that. You know, when you go from, uh, you know, 25, 30 beds to 
or 50 beds to 75 beds to 100 beds to 300 beds. You know, you look at that and the dynamics there, the cultural dynamics that you have to look at is tough. I used to know every inmate that came to our jail, every inmate. Um, you know, I ran the jail in the city. We had the same people every weekend. You know, it's the Otis Campbell of the world, you know, we, we dealt with. You've all, if you've been in our jail, you've had the same people. And now we get people we don't know uh, because, you know, society's changed. And I, you know, I told you we are kind of the, the uh, downhill side of, of Franklin County. Everything flows down into my county. Uh, and so we're getting people out of Columbus that, you know, that a different dynamic of inmates. So our staff, we have to build the jail to accommodate that need, not the needs we had with bringing Otis to jail every weekend. That's what we had before, and that was, that was a comfort level. But now we've got to realize we've got some bad people out there that have to be incarcerated. I think just the, the prime example was the incident last week in Muskegon County. Uh, and I, you know, I'm not throwing them under the bus, but you read it in the paper, so it's not like you heard it from me the first time. They had three inmates overpowered a guard. They got what? They got a key. And so they could, and, and they were workers, uh, you know, inmate workers, so they kind of knew the layout. They knew, probably knew what key to get what door, and before long, they're out of the facility. They go through, run a, a, a crossover from the courthouse, and out they go, and they're, they're gone for a day or two. Um, when you build a jail, that's what we keep in mind. We're, we don't have a key once you get inside the jail. It's everything's out of that central control. That was foreign to us. And that was a long, that was a process with working with our vendor, trying to understand their content. They knew what they were doing. We had to learn their system instead of them learning our system. They, it, our system wasn't going to work in this new facility. So that was a cultural shock we had. We had to understand what it was going to take to have one person in central control controlling all these doors around our every pod. And we had to learn patience. I had to learn patience in hitting that door and, and knowing I have to wait for somebody else to let me in that door. But that was the security of our system, is that so someone else can't be waiting on the other side of the door to get out because it's, it's being, we have 200 cameras in our jail. I'd like to have 300. Um, you know, you can't have too many cameras, and don't, you know, you, you've got to have strategically placed cameras in your jail. Today's society calls for it, so. It's been a, it's been a process as, as the National Sheriff uh, Association president, I've dealt with a lot of jails. I visited, I visit jails when I travel around the country. Um, visit with sheriffs, uh, most sheriffs run jails. Uh, some states they don't, they're privatized or they're um, um, ran by a conglomerate of whatever it may be of, of officials. Uh, but those jails ran by sheriffs, the sheriffs have that ownership of their jail. They need to know that when they, when they are looking at upgrading, when they're looking at being um, uh, responsible for building a new facility, that they have the very best of the equipment out there. And that's why we rely on you, those that you that are vendors, uh, that are manufacturers, that you've put a lot of thought and design into what we're going to get because we're, we're, we are we are we are going to be dependent on your technical advice. You know, we know how to run the jail. You need to you need to be able to educate us on how to secure that jail properly in today's environment, not in the 1884 environment. That worked great for a while, now we moved on. I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I, um, I, 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 I'm so honored to be representing the state of Ohio on a national platform. Um, it, my, my tenure is almost over with. In June, I, I stepped down as president, and then I become the, I don't know, the guy in the back row. Um, but um, it, it's given me an opportunity to see our nation on a different playing field. Uh, interacting with Washington, D.C. on a daily basis is, is a struggle, um, but it's been educational as well uh, to realize that 
our problems in Fayette County are not unlike any of the problems across the state of Ohio and not like any and, and, and they're not unlike any of the problems across the country. We all have our own localized issues and localized concerns and I'm sure there's sheriffs and there's vendors all across the country having meetings like this to discuss these very things. We need to discuss these things. We need, I'm sure Muskegon County will be discussing these things in short order um, because we had the same situation. When the state of Ohio came in to us and said, we need fire escapes on your upper level. Now we don't need fire escapes, it's a fireproof building. It's made of you know, limestone and concrete, it can't burn. I had to have, so we had to put exterior <coughs> fire escapes on to satisfy the requirements of the state of Ohio. And in that process, we had an escape. Now, this happened in probably 1992, 93, 94, and uh, four inmates escaped because they, the construction, the internal construction was, uh, we, we <coughs> didn't pay attention to things and it, and it cost us four inmates that escaped. But even then they knew they needed a new jail. And look how long it took us to get there. And, uh, but I'm hoping that the jail I built in 2020, opened in 2022, is a jail that will sustain us for generations to come. And I hope that you, as you're going through this process, you'll do the same. You'll look at things that'll be meaningful now, but also will have a long-term impact on your operation and the security of your jails across the, uh, that are across the country. I thank you for your time. I thank you for the invitation to be here and being a partner with uh, uh, Poly Jail and, uh, and the continued success of not only my jail, but every jail in here and, and the, the, what you represent as far as jail security. Thank you.